Good morning, everybody. Wonderful to be gathered together again. What a week we have had. What a week. Man, interesting. Um, we have done a five-day BBS before, and uh, this year we only did a three-day, but it felt like a five-day. By Friday evening, I was like, okay, I, this feels kind of like a normal Friday as far as uh, being worn out, but uh, it was wonderful. It was great. I, just so much enthusiasm, so many smiling faces, and uh, you know, as the song leader, you get to you know, see everybody, hear everybody, and so I was just you know, encouraged all week, and uh, anybody who is here, you would have been encouraged as well. And, uh, and we roll on, right? This is the summer, so we roll on to the next ministry type thing we're doing. And um, camp is coming, and so I'm, I'm hoping that you're getting excited for that. I don't know, you know what your participation will be, but pray for camp. Pray now that we have campers who come and who can hear God's word, maybe for the first time understand the gospel and how God loves them and God wants them with him eternally, because that's what we try to get across. And we do it in various ways and goofy ways sometimes, but it translates, it gets through sometimes. So uh, pray for that. Pray for that as it move, we move into the end of June and into July. Uh, there's just so much to look forward to and see what God uh, is going to be doing over the summer. And then, of course, Mexico will come at the end of July. So I'm being self-serving here, but pray for our Mexico trip. Um, I don't want to worry anybody, but pray that my renewed passport comes in soon. Yeah, I know, I know, it, uh, it's getting close, so, uh, but it'll get here, I'm sure. Uncle Sam will find a way, so let's pray together. We're thankful, dear Father, that you love us, that in your immense power, in your sovereignty, in your plan for this world, you include our devotion to you, our love for you, our faithfulness to you as part of a wonderful plan. And Father, we pray that as your people, we can live that way. We can trust in you, knowing that you guide us, that you have a plan, and that your plan unfolds beyond our understanding sometimes. Give us that peace that uh, is talked about in your word that surpasses our understanding and help us to see the good that you're working. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. This sermon series that began last week is simply called Summer Reading, and all I'm going to do is uh, let everybody know ahead of time there's a chapter in the Bible that we're going to be looking at on Sunday. And uh, this week will be from uh, Genesis. It's going to be narrative. I'm trying to mix it up. Sometimes it'll be a story chapter. Other times it'll be more of a uh, you know, thought-provoking chapter like last week was. And so we're going to mix it up. So this week is a story. And again, if you've been here this week, you'd be very familiar with this story because it's going to be a snapshot from a moment in the, the life of Joseph. And when you take one chapter out of the life of Joseph, you're missing like 500 chapters because it's humongous. It's a long story. But that's where I want to begin. Uh, we have to talk about Joseph's life before we get to the point that we want to talk about today, you know, before the chapter we talk about. And Joseph is the 11th son in his family. And you know, it's hard to tell here, of course, but you, know, you would think that the 11th son would be low on the totem pole. That's just automatic. You know, this would be the, the youngest, of course, and he would be the youngest of many other brothers. And so, uh, but here's the thing with Joseph. Joseph does not have a, you know, a ho-hum birth because he's the firstborn child of Jacob's most beloved wife, uh, and that is Rachel. And so his birth, we gotta bring up, and it's an event, it's major, it's huge. Uh, Rachel finally has a child, and she has uh, Joseph. And she'll have one more before she dies, but uh, he has not yet been born. Interestingly, I, I asked my family this as a trivia question, but where was Joseph born? Joseph was not born in Canaan, in the Promised Land. Neither were any of his older brothers. They were all born before uh, Jacob came back from being in exile when he was uh, in trouble with Esau, if you remember that whole story. So he's, they were born in Padan Aram, actually. Uh, only Benjamin was born uh, in the Promised Land. That's a sidetrack, right? And with a narrative, you sometimes have to take these little side roads. But Life for Joseph, you know, it begins actually pretty special, way more special than an 11th son should expect. And then it kind of gets better 
because he's not just seen and celebrated as this, you know, the, the one son from my most beloved wife, but then, you know, Jacob just continues to lavish on him and treat him in a special way, gives him the coat of many colors, or as uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber called it, the amazing Technicolor dream coat, right? He keeps favoring his son, giving him gifts, and they don't like it, the brothers don't. But then Joseph gets dreams, and in these dreams, he is kind of the object of glory. His brothers are bowing down to him as, uh, as sheaves, and then you know, the sun and moon and, and, and stars bow down to him, and uh, it's, it's glory. Well, telling the dreams, wearing the coat, it gets Joseph in trouble, if you remember. And his brothers are so mad at him that they decide to throw him into a pit and, uh, and kill him. And then one of the brothers says, well, wait a minute, we could, we could make money. We could sell him instead. So they sell him into slavery to these passing traders. And uh, they then take him to Egypt. And I only say that goes further down in, on the categories because he doesn't know Egyptian culture. He's being brought into there as a slave, and it's, it's a low point. Now, Joseph, if, if there's people in the Bible and you say they have like a superpower, uh, I know like Jesus has a lot of superpowers, you know, because he's the son of God and he works miracles. But Joseph's power, you know, that God seemed to be gifting him is that he succeeds. Joseph can't help but like constantly succeed. That's what God's plan is for, for Joseph. So even when he's made a slave, he's made like the head slave, right? When, when he's there at Potiphar's house, he basically becomes the guy in charge, second to Potiphar, in charge of the whole household. And Potiphar prospers with Joseph in charge. So it's, it's pretty good. But then he is falsely accused of attacking Potiphar's wife and he is imprisoned. And I don't include this, but while he's in prison, he becomes the top prisoner, right? He's, it just keeps happening to Joseph. He's like, I just feel like I kind of just rise to the top wherever I am, but he is imprisoned. And that's where he is at this moment that we're about to read in Genesis chapter 41. So keep this in mind. This is Joseph's life so far. And like your life, it has high points, and it has some low points, and his low points are probably lower than the low points that you've experienced, I would imagine. But uh, there he is. So let's go into uh, Genesis chapter 41, where we are not in the jail. We are instead in the palace of Egypt with Pharaoh. After two whole years, this is after Jesus, Joseph and the dreams, which we'll get to in a moment. After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile, and behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in the reed grass. And behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows in the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive, plump cows, and Pharaoh awoke. Plumpness is attractive in cows. Interesting to know. Uh, not so much in humans, I've discovered. You know, I, I don't find myself to be more attractive as I get plump, but I'm not made for you know, consumption, I suppose. So <laughs> he falls asleep and has a second dream. And he fell asleep and dreamed a second time, and behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump, full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So in the morning his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. And then his cupbearer suddenly says, oh, wait a minute, I just remembered something. Then the, cup bearer, the chief cupbearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today, meaning I should have done something and I totally forgot. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me and the chief baker in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, we dreamed on the same night, he and I, each having a dream with its own interpretation. A young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. When we told him, he interpreted our dreams to us, giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And as he interpreted to us, so it came about. 
I was restored to my office and the baker was hanged, which we did not avoid in VBS. We actually said that the baker died. I was a little bit surprised. So were the children. <laughs> then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. When, when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said that you, that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Now he goes on to relate the dream, and as happens in Genesis often, a story is told verbatim, exactly as uh, it had just been told just a bit before. So he tells of the dreams, he tells of the cows, he tells of the wheat, and Joseph gives the interpretation. Then Pharaoh said to Pharaoh, Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is, as I told Pharaoh, God has shown to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, but after them there will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land, and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow, for it will be very severe. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. Now therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers of the land and take one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years." And let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for, good in the, for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Egypt so that the land may not perish through the famine. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. And Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this in whom is the spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, see, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. So in a few paragraphs of the Bible, things have changed for Joseph because God has brought him in just the right time with Pharaoh having just the right dream so that all could be interpreted. And not only that, but Joseph could get the solution and, and Pharaoh says, well then, you're my man. And things are, are looking up, you know. It, it, Joseph's life you know, it was going not so great. Uh, it, it certainly was at a low point when he's there in prison, even if you're the best prisoner, I would imagine. I don't have personal experience, but even if you're the top prisoner, you're still in the pit, as it says there. But all of a sudden, the difference between where Joseph was and where he is at the, at the end of this conversation with Pharaoh, it's, the difference is amazing. This is off the charts. And so when it's off the charts, what do you need? You need bigger charts. So I switched this around so that we could see some proportion here. This is Joseph's life. By the, by the end of chapter 41, which we haven't gotten to yet, but by this point, chapter 41, things are better. You know, it, it's not just like he got out of jail. That would have been great, right? That would have been wonderful to be a free man again, of course. He's a free man and accepted into Pharaoh's court and then placed above everybody else in Pharaoh's court, second only to Pharaoh. This is incredible. This is Egypt. Everybody knows about Egypt. It's a world power and had been for a thousand years already. And that's Joseph's life as blessed by God. Then we get the rest of the details. I'm not gonna read all the details between here and the end, but we're gonna pick up a couple slides here. 
and he made him ride in his second chariot. Nobody rides in the first chariot, okay? That's just Pharaoh's chariot, but he gets the second one. And they called out before him, bow the knee. Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaph Anath Peniel, and he gave him in marriage to Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On. So Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. Before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph. This is skipping down to verse 50. Were born to Joseph, Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore, the, bore them to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For, he said, God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. The name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. Manasseh sounds like the Hebrew verb for to make to forget. It's not to forget, it's to make to forget. So my Greek teacher would have been, very, and my Hebrew teacher too, they would have said, look, don't tell people this is the verb to forget. This is to make to forget because they quibble over these kinds of things, these grammatical guys. And Ephraim sounds like the Hebrew to make fruitful. In other words, it's a passive. So God is making me forget. God is making me fruitful. That's what their name means. It's not just forgetting and fruitfulness. It is that God is, is making us that way. All right, so the rest of the chapter sort of just describes that this went exactly according to plan. And Pharaoh does an interesting thing. He collects all the food and then sells it back to everybody. Isn't that genius? You know, that sounds just like uh, what some governments would do, right? And uh, there it is. But uh, they, they survive. And then the whole world is in famine as well. And they come to Egypt to buy grain. And you know what happens next when he is, is speaking to his, he sees his brothers and has interactions with them, etc. But to focus down on uh, this chapter, and the, the story of Joseph that had come before. What we see in his life is a faith that clings to God's promises. That's the verb that you have to use here. He is clinging to the promises of God. And what do I mean? I mean that God gave him a dream. It wasn't just the generic promises or the promises to Abraham. He has those in his mind, of course. But God made specific promises to him, showed him his future. And Joseph says, okay, you know, God shows me this. I understand what it means. Everybody else understands what it means. That's why they're so mad. And so I have this promise, and I'm, I'm going to hold on to it. And then, of course, things begin to happen. And it reminds me of, in Hebrews, the writer says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. You have to hold fast to your confession, to God's promises, to what you believe, only when it's difficult to do so. When there are winds against you, there's headwinds against you. When you're looking at life and you don't understand, you know, it doesn't seem to be matching up to the promises that God gave. We go back to the old chart, the, the smaller chart. You know, when, G when Joseph is here in jail at that point, he could be looking back on his life and thinking to himself, how could God have promised me one thing and then I end up first in the pit in Dothan where they were going to leave me for dead and then second it says he's in the pit in Egypt when he's falsely accused and he's imprisoned if I was Joseph I'd be a person saying I guess I got it wrong or God changed his mind or whatever else as you look but not him because multiple times when he speaks he mentions the Lord. He mentions God specifically. So when Potiphar's wife comes to him with a temptation, he says to her, I'm not going to do this because my master trusts me. And by the way, I don't want to dishonor God. So right there, he doesn't say, I'm firmly believing and clinging to the promises of God. But he still has a faith, even though he was a slave, nearly killed, sold down to Egypt. And then when he is imprisoned, of course, he maintains his faith as well. He tells the, the two men, I, I can interpret your dreams because God's enabled this. 
So in our minds, in our hearts, there are always two lists forming when it comes to the promises of God. We have the list we make faith because of, right? And we make this list and we say, all those high points, all of those golden points in our life, they were so wonderful, weren't they? You know, when we ask God for this and we receive that, when we made special plans and, and, and it came through that those plans could be fulfilled, and we received good things, that was wonderful. And, and blessings we hadn't even expected just showed up on our doorstep. Wasn't this wonderful? And you, you add to that list. So I have faith in God. I cling to his promises because of all these reasons, because he's shown himself to be faithful. But there's a second list, and that is faith in spite of. That's not a list we like to talk about, because that list says, as I'm going through life, there is real pain. There is real loss, and it really doesn't make sense. And all the promises that I seem to read in Scripture, especially when I read a book like Proverbs. Proverbs says, you do this, things are going to work out great. You're going to have a life that's just constantly fruitful, constantly uh, enriching. You'll have wealth. You'll have this. You'll have all. And you read that and you say, okay, I'm going to believe that in spite of what's been happening in my life. Joseph clung to those promises in spite of. I have to think so. And we'll get a little bit of an indicator as we look at this. Faith in spite of. We know that he maintained his faith. The first time he comes before Pharaoh, that when, he's, when he's brought before him, he makes this statement. Pharaoh says, I've had these dreams, and I know you can interpret them. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me, God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer, or God will describe Pharaoh's welfare, as the translation could be. But in the Hebrew, there's just two words there at the beginning, Bilade Elohim. So when Pharaoh says, I know you're the man, you can help me here, Joseph says, not in me. That's the first word, that's what it means. Not in me, God. I mean, he's, he's in front of the, 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 the head of the country, the head of the Egyptian empire. And in his second word that he speaks, the first word is not me. It's not in me. And the second word he speaks is God. And Pharaoh three more times will mention God. You notice that in this conversation? He mentions Elohim when he says, can I find a spirit of the Lord, a spirit of God in anybody else? And he mentions God two more times after that. So Joseph has this faith, and it's on display. When he speaks, he knows I'm in God's hand. You know, God has, has given me the ability to interpret dreams. He's promised me things. And no matter what those dips are in my timeline, I'm going to have faith in spite of. I'm going to trust him in spite of. Another thing I see in this chapter, and you probably see it too, is God's amazing long game. That's the only way to describe it. And I think we did a good job with VBS this year because what we did was we stretched out his story over three nights. It's pretty rare that we, you know, take a VBS and do one big story. It was helpful here, though, because you got to see, yeah, you know, Joseph, it's a long story. God takes him through. When we talk about God, we're on a different time scale where he looks at time differently, experiences it differently. Peter tries to get this across to us. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Usually we focus on that second one, you know, that uh, a thousand years is nothing to God. But that all, you know, look at the beginning also, that one day is a thousand years. It's a different time scale. He can, he can drill down to my one day and just look at the whole thing as if it was a thousand years and know it in that kind of detail. That's amazing. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise. Again, almost echoing the idea we find in Joseph. As some account slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. When you look at the story of Joseph, notice, 20 years before the famine, 
God began the rescue plan. 20 years before. So for 20 years, God says, okay, I know what I'm going to do. I know what it's going to look like in the end. Fascinating to me. Now, but wait, somebody might say, I've already anticipated an argument here. But wait, God could have just made sure it rained and there would have been no famine, right? That could have been the solution. That, uh, you know, there didn't have to be this, this famine that came. God could have just done it that way and then, you know, nobody would have had to be rescued. And that's true, right? True. However, because I'm going to argue with myself here, maybe I should turn. You know, we talked about this. You know. uh, however, the brothers' enmity, their, their hatred of Joseph would have remained, wouldn't it? By the end of Joseph's life, there's, you know, we didn't, this isn't in chapter 41, so we didn't talk about that. But there's, there's reconciliation. There's forgiveness on Joseph's part. He could have used the power of Egypt to really make them pay, but he doesn't. You know, he is merciful toward them. Uh, and they are grateful for that. They all, you know, live together at that point. But the enmity would have remained if, if all of this hadn't happened. Uh, Egypt would not have heard of God, not the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, and God's glory would not have been revealed in Joseph's rise. Wouldn't have had the opportunity if there wasn't this obstacle that was coming into the future. So that's Joseph's life. Here's the question for you. What is God up to in the long game of your life? Are there things only now unfolding that God has been working on for 20 years? It's possible. And it, it's possible that some of the low points were even part of that. You know, we only know in retrospect. That's, that's our, our, our curse, right? We, we, we don't know the future. You know, Joseph got a chance to know the future. He had to still believe it. He got to see those dreams, though. It, for us, for the most part, we only know looking back, and we can try to connect the dots sometimes. Uh, but that, the short game, the day-to-day, -day, the year-to-year, -year, will involve those low points, will involve those times on the time scale that are on the timeline that uh, you, know, you can't characterize as, as golden days, as, as moments of uh, enjoyment. But Christ promises the ultimate turnaround, the ultimate rise from the depths, from the lowest points of our life, he promises that one day it's not just for this life, but also for the life to come that he has offered himself for us, opened the door for us. So like Joseph, we are to live in this life. And I want to use the names of his sons here in a, in a funny way. Faithfully forgetful and fruitful. I think that's what we see in Joseph. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Just to remind you, you know, Joseph's sons are Ephraim and Manasseh. Manasseh is made to forget. Ephraim is made fruitful. And I looked, and I, I, there's, there's maybe one other example. So there's really only two times in the entire Bible, New Testament, Old Testament, there's only two times where forgetting is a good thing. Almost always forgetting is like, oh, you're forgetting the Lord or, or the Lord has forgotten me. You know, what, what's going on here? Am I, have I been forgotten by the Lord? But here, what Joseph says is, God has made me to forget my hardships and he's made me to forget my father's home because that's a source of pain to me. Now, does he totally forget? You actually can't say what you've forgotten. Right? Oh, I, I, I wish I could remember that worst day of, my, of school when the teacher said this, this, and this, and this, and this, but I forget. I mean, you, know, you can't do that. You can't do that. So he hasn't like totally forgotten, but it's more the idea of he has helped me to not dwell on that. Uh, you know, this, this amazing turnaround in his life has overshadowed, has outshined all of the life before. That includes, by the way, the high points. And that's a very Christian idea. That's a very uh, you know, New Testament you know, kingdom idea. Because we find in Romans, you know, Paul says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So what is coming for the believer is not worth, you know, you, you, that, that amazing day, the, the, the eternal life we'll experience with God, it outshines 
the momentary troubles, the sufferings that we experience now, they will be considered, they just can't be compared to the glory that is to come. So the sufferings don't compare, but also the good, the gains, the, the positives in life. For whatever gain I had, Paul said, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. So for Paul, he sees, like, like in Joseph's life, this thing that God has done, this amazing you know, rescue that God has, has worked in his life, it's outshined everything. It's outshined the bad. It's it helped him for, to forget his hardships. He can endure anything now, he says in other letters, for the sake of Christ. And for the sake of Christ, all the gains I had, all those golden days, all those high points, none of that matters. None of it matters. I'm not going to say anymore that I'm, I'm the Hebrew of Hebrews, that I'm the Pharisee of Pharisees, that I'm you know, trained by this guy, that I don't, I don't need my credentials anymore. Because something has happened in my life that has outshined it all. All those points I leave behind. To sum it up, he says in Romans 7, Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law, to the, to the, for his people is the past, through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. This moment has happened for us, Paul says. And now we just live in the fruitfulness that God's going to be working in our life. And we remain, we abide in the vine, as Jesus says in John chapter 15. We abide with him, and he continues to make our lives fruitful. And the fruit we receive, the life we now live, it doesn't compare. It, it outshines. It's, it's so much more glorious than the life that we lived before. That's the lesson I see from this chapter in Joseph's life, where he is a man who knows God's promises and hangs on for dear life. He's, he's holding on to the fact that God is still with him. God is still promising good things in his life. That Romans 8, 28, that God is working all things for good, is still going to be true in my life, Joseph says. God's amazing long game, that God has a plan that spans so much more than what we can fathom or can understand. And he's always working out good, and he's taking even the bad decisions we make and turning things around back toward the good. As long as we remain forgetful about the things that, first of all, we thought were special and great and wonderful, but also we forget the hardships in comparison to the wonderful glory that he shows within us. That's the lesson this morning. Joseph has an example, but really the star of the show here is God who is working amazing things. And he's working amazing things in your life. Maybe this morning you need to come to the, that God who knows your life so well. And maybe you've wandered from him, but you want to come back. And like a, a shepherd leading a sheep, Jesus says, I'm going to gather you back into my arms. That's my promise to you. If you need to be baptized into Christ and begin that walk with him, now with a conscience that's clean, then that opportunity is yours. Come as we stand and sing.